this is my favorite out of all of them because we've already solved the climate crisis in the past and people don't know about it because we did it so well. I think this is something that I, I always try to tell people when they, you know, are looking for some hope. Speaking of sustainability, a podcast where we talk to front runners, innovators and business specialists on, well, sustainability and where they think their industries are headed and more importantly, how they can make them more sustainable. Hi there, this is Hani Larma from EcoChain and in today's conversation, I'm speaking with my colleague Sasla Quist. We're talking about a really important topic today. I think we're all familiar with climate denial, but there's actually another phenomena which often gets in the way of taking action against climate change, and that's called climate delay. So we're going to talk about the four counter arguments for climate action and how to tackle those. See you in the conversation. Hi, Zasla. Thank you so much for joining me again. Yeah, no, thank you so much for asking me again. <laughs> it's great to have you on the podcast. It was really nice. Yes. Uh, also last time. And we have a very, very interesting and important topic uh, to speak about also today. To introduce this topic, um, I actually found uh, a very interesting article that was in The Guardian. The title of this article is called Our Biggest Enemy is No Longer Climate Denial, But Climate Delay. Um, and there's a quote in there that is saying, future generations will look back on the climate events of 2021 and say, that was the year they ran out of excuses. <laughs> well, we know well. <laughs> there are still some excuses uh, and there are still some concerns uh, regarding climate action. Um, and it's really important that we yeah tackle those those arguments yeah i think it would be maybe good to go into kind of firstly um yeah what is this what are these arguments where do they come from and and of course how can we um tackle them how can we solve this so the floor is yours Sasla. <laughs> thank you yeah what an introduction yeah no i i think uh what you just mentioned I, I think we've experienced it all right um i mean you're you're talking to somebody about climate change and either that person is hopeful or they're really not or or they come up with oh it's not my responsibility or and, and it's very logical right these kind of reactions because it's not like you know we're all sipping tea and saving the world it's it's quite a mm -hmm. task yeah so it's not just in my personal you know uh sphere that i've noticed these kinds of arguments and I can imagine that, yeah, people working in a company and have to, you know, be the, the cheerleader of sustainability in their company <laughs> really must yeah. face these kinds of arguments too. So I, I think it comes from a, a place of, of fear, right? And I mean, mm -hmm. I can say truthfully that I've, I've experienced that as well, of course. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a very human way as well to respond. It also kind of reminds me of something that uh, a previous podcast guest, um, Kimberly Miner, was uh, talking about, that it's sometimes really hard for us to grasp the entirety of uh, climate change yeah. because it is a, such a global issue and and it kind of needs to be broken down into actionable steps that people can take because otherwise it, it can get quite overwhelming um, yeah. and I think yeah, that yeah, we yeah, have to have yeah. indeed sympathy um, for for that those reactions and like you said they are they are quite understandable you have prepared the sort of four main arguments uh, against climate change that we hear most often. So I think mm -hmm. what could be really interesting is to kind of dive into each of those separately. Maybe we yeah. can go yeah. already into the first one. Yeah, no, definitely. So um, this is, uh, by the way, like, I, I think it's good to mention that um, this, uh, this is all inspired by an article. And this, is yeah. the, this article is called um, Discourses of Climate Delay, which is by uh, Lam et al. And it was uh, created in 2020. And basically, right. this article is super interesting because it's a group of uh, social scientists um, that all gathered their insights that they, they found on climate change. So how people mm -hmm. react to climate change. And they kind of right. bundled it together in this one article. And indeed, um, they kind of grouped all the arguments that people say uh, that can delay climate change. So uh, the people that they've researched, they do believe that there will be climate, that there is a climate <laughs> disaster going on, but their right. arguments are here to delay it. And they've grouped this into four. And um, yeah, yeah I, I, think, uh, I think it's very good that we indeed tap into those and see uh, how we can counter them so we can give people some, uh, some hope. 
yeah, the first one, I think <laughs> we've all seen as much, especially if you work in, you know, business, uh, I think yeah. it's uh, redirecting responsibility. So it's not mm -hmm. me, they should do it first. Yeah, so there are a couple of examples. I mean, we're not going to tap into every individual example that you can that you can name here. But I think yeah. one that we see a lot, especially now in also creating policies, but also, you know, in general for, for companies to take action is to look at, okay, but I'm not the biggest contributor. So why would I right. be the one that has to start, right? So I, I yeah. think that's one that, um, yeah, also I noticed quite a lot. Also, if you're in the news, <laughs> if you just yeah. read the news. Um, so I, I think we can all relate to, to that one. And yeah. uh, I think the second one would be um, the free rider excuse, which I also think is very, very apparent in the business uh, industry right now. And that's kind mm -hmm. of the idea that sustainability will weaken your competitive position in the market. Mm -hmm. So if you are making a change, you are in that moment, you know, not in your full potential yet because you're changing and other companies, they will take advantage of that. So they right. won't re reduce their own, but they will take advantage of your changing position and only increase their very bad products, for example. So, um, yeah. And as I said, I, I think from all of them, this would be one of the, uh, <laughs> the, the redirecting responsibility arguments are some that I think we see the most. Um, yeah. and it is, as, as we already said in the beginning, quite understandable, right? Because it's a big task right. and you're always hoping that somebody else starts first, but yeah, that's not maybe how it should go. Yeah, how could we counter this? Like if, if somebody, for example, encounters this in their company, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's someone in the team that's like, hey, it's going to weaken our position. Let's not work on it. Let's see how uh, other people do it first. And then, then we'll see if we want to get involved in this. How could we counter that? I think this is a question that we receive a lot, <laughs> right? Because right. it's, I think it's one of the main things that sustainability managers or sustainability ambassadors face. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's convincing people that they have to take action. And I think there are kind of three points that we can name there. So the first one will be legislation, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not like, oh, they have to start first. No, everybody has to start. That's, that's what's happening right now. The European uh, Commission there, they just released a new proposal for like a very big legislative reporting directive. And um, this means that uh, a lot of companies, like 50,000 already, uh, have to start reporting on their sustainability. It's not like, you know, <laughs> there's an excuse anymore to just point to other pe other companies. Everybody has to no. start. So if that pressure isn't on yet, you can always also say that customer demand is increasing, right? And I think mm -hmm. in customer research, like at sustainability, a lot of research has been done on, um, yeah, B to C. So really, you know, consumers, but also for suppliers or, you know, your own customers, even if they're businesses. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all a trickle down effect, right? So demand for sustainable products is increasing. There was a very big uh, survey done by Simon mm -hmm. Couture and Partners, so very big consultants, and they, they did a global survey and they found that like 60% of consumers they are now um, seeing sustainability as an important purchase cr criterion for their products. Yeah, and also I think that that is a really strong counter to, um, you know, thinking that uh, working on sustainability will weaken the position in the market yeah. because actually um, in the long run, it's most likely going to strengthen your position. Future proofing for yeah. that demand. I mean, the demand's already there, but I think in the long run, it's it's not only going to be something that is is a nice to have, but is really something that people are really going to focus on. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, you know, if <laughs> if it's not your investors, it's going to be your customers that are going to demand more sustainable products. And then it's not just, you know, oh, uh, we have to do it. It's a, we have to do it because it, it's also business, you know, so. Right. Future proofing becomes business proofing, <laughs> kind right. of, and, and I think that's indeed that's a very strong argument. And I, oh, I already named investors, but, and I think that's the third main point. Um, yeah. You know, you have you uh, they work a lot together, also with uh, big investment um, companies and groups. And next to the CSRD that we've already named, mm -hmm. there's also the tax me, which also focuses a lot on the financial aspect of sustainability. And also mm -hmm. for investors, um, I think it is also BlackRock. <laughs> we all know that one, but they also said yeah. that, um, you know, if you look at as an investor, as a company, that the SDGs, for example, yeah. they have a, a lot of overlaps with normal mm -hmm. points that investors already look at. So if you don't 
invest in sustainability, investors will see that as a disadvantage for right. how long your company will thrive. So that's also a, a big exactly. deal right now. So yeah, yeah, it's pressure coming from a lot of points. And I, I think that, um, you know, these are very relevant counter arguments. My final note on this, on this argument is, you know, customers want it, investors want it. I mean, engaging in sustainability is also good for your marketing in the end, right? Because it's, it's such mm -hmm. a, an important aspect of business. And it's, we, we also see that consumers are more favorable to more sustainable businesses. I, th I think that it's not only, you know, about the, the legislation and, and, you know, being able to have investors interested in your company. It's also about mm -hmm. what you want to show the world, you know, what, what kind right. of values you have as a company. And I think that's a very important aspect as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next argument. Uh, the next argument is called pushing non-transformative solutions. And I think that we, I, I'll explain it in a second, but I think this argument really pops up a lot also in politics, <laughs> in yeah. uh, creating sustainability policies. What it means is that people want to avoid very harsh and strict measures uh, for climate mm -hmm. change and they want to be more comfortable, smooth a voluntary route. So they're kind of, you know, saying, okay, things need to be done, but they don't want to go for, you know, maybe the extreme steps that actually have to be taken to, you know, tackle climate change, but go for easier routes. What that means is, for example, you know, you promote inefficient solutions. So uh, you look at targets that might be a little bit easier to tackle um, and maybe come up with excuses. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, heavily rely on, for example, uh, technology. So that's a, a, an argument that pops up a lot. Yeah, right. um, technology will happen. <laughs> a bit vague, right. but technology and will save us and it will fix our problems. So we should carry on as usual. And, and, and that is a bit dangerous, right? Because, but also mm -hmm. I think almost the most understandable out of all these arguments um, because, I mean, I've noticed it in my behavior as well. There's just a lot to be done a lot yeah. and like extreme steps have to be taken as well right we're now at a point where we really really need to start acting and mm -hmm. this could be very scary and it's very different for people because they get out of their comfort zone and i think also um yeah one of the kind of again understandable things about this is that pushing technology as a solution is not necessarily a bad thing because no, it can no, help us no. and, it, and it will definitely help us in, in achieving these sustainable goals, but it's not going to do it alone. And I think, uh, yeah, maybe you can elaborate, Zasla, on the hopeful counter argument uh, of this one. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, you've already said it. Um, technology is amazing, right? What, what people can do and what people can make, it's, it's incredible. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it is very good to place hope into, you know, what, what, the, what kind of innovative technology people are making. I mean, <laughs> we, we have tools that allow you to calculate footprints. We have tools that allow you to indeed capture carbon from the air and turn it into uh, stones that you, or rock you can use for building uh, houses, for example. So there are so right. many great things happening. But in the end, it's the people behind it that make the strategy and that create the technology that have to place it in a bigger picture. But in the end, it's the people who use it uh, and who use it in the proper way that make a change. And yeah. um, the client foresight, it's uncomfortable, but it will become even more uncomfortable if we're too slow in acting. Right. <laughs> and I think that's, yeah. that is already the best argument you can give, right? The sooner people start with sustainable innovation and with creating a good strategy and using the technology to reach that strategy and goal, yeah. the better and easier we will be able to manage the consequences of climate change. So I guess that would for me be just a summary of the best kind of counter argument you can give. So the, the third uh, argument that they uh, mentioned in the article, I think it's emphasizing the downsides of climate policy. So we kind of already yeah. spoke about that climate policy will be coming up um, and quite soon, actually. Could you elaborate a little bit more on these downsides? I think this is also something we see coming back in um, politics and which trickles down into also companies' um, emotions in this whole climate action discourse. And that's that yeah. um, the downsides of climate policies, for example, are a bigger burden than the consequences of taking no climate action. I think one of the, the main arguments that pops up here is social injustice. So climate policies, yeah, it's all nice, but they will only lead to greater costs because people will lose their jobs or 
certain products won't be here anymore. Consumer opportunities will disappear. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. companies have to stop entire product lines and this will all cost us so much money and jobs. I, I think that this is a very big argument um, in yeah. this uh, in this year. So you mentioned this loss of jobs, for example. Um, for the counter argument, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very relevant fear, right? Because right. change always requires change kind you know it, it sounds yeah very simple but um in the end we if we have to switch entire systems right that we well the kind of process that we're in right now um this will mean that certain jobs will disappear because you know we're we're, we're kind of letting certain aspects of our business go and replacing yeah. it with newer more sustainable ones but uh i uh i was um uh, researching this subject and I found a super interesting research by McKinsey. So they estimated, yes, there will be job loss. So 185 million jobs will be lost by 2050, but mm -hmm. sustainability will also create new jobs. And they s estimated that the creation of new jobs will be 200 million by 2050. Yeah, so quite a lot more. Well, yeah, so quite a lot more. <laughs> um, so yes, people will lose their jobs, but sustainability will also create many, many, many new jobs as well. So I think what people should do is to see this as a mind shift change as well. Start with product innovations, uh, opportunities, the demand is there, right? The legislation is there. Uh, you have to, but try to see it from a different way. So don't see it as yeah. losing something, but gaining something new creating something new yeah and i think that you also see that on a university level um that there's a lot of like new courses coming up for different types mm -hmm. of sustainable jobs and um uh, yeah. and i think that's also really interesting going into the future our last um argument yes would you like the to June one <laughs> yes <laughs> yes so i i think this is an argument that we've all well, if you're engaged with sustainability, um, we've all experienced this once at least. And that is mm -hmm. the surrendering to climate change feeling. Uh, I think everybody's not, not per se scared, but they know what a task that we have ahead when it comes to mm -hmm. um, tackling the climate crisis. And I think for some people, as we already said, right, it's uh, in the beginning, it's such a big thing to grasp that it can be very overwhelming. And I think for a lot of people, this can also result in doom talk, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's going to happen anyway. And yeah, all these goals are just impossible. And, you know, I, I guess we just have to, to deal with it that this is going to be our future. Um, I think an example would indeed be doomism. So any action we are taking, it's too little, it's too late. Catastrophic climate change is already settled and we have to start mm -hmm. preparing or adapting, you know, it's kind of all those, those doom movies, <laughs> yeah, right. scenarios. Um, and I think that this is just, um, again, such a human reaction and a very, very logical one. And one that I've also seen, you know, a lot of people changing, but that this is also an emotion that they started with when you think about climate yeah. change. And I think that again, goes back to this whole, um, yeah, perspective that uh, we have to have sympathy for people. It's it's such a big topic and, and it might be quite hard to grasp, especially if you don't have those um, actionable steps uh, that you yeah. can take uh, in your work or in your daily life. If you don't kind of um, see those, then yeah, it is a very logical uh, feeling to think, okay, what can I really, really do about this? Um, yeah. And maybe then for, for people, it's often easier than to just say, okay, I'm doing nothing. Okay, so let's say, again, we're going back to this kind of company perspective. If there yeah. are people in the company um, that um, yeah, have this perspective, think like, okay, I don't think that for us as a company that we can really tackle this or do anything about this. It doesn't seem like there yeah. are that many solutions. Yeah, what could yeah. be that hopeful counter argument again. This is my favorite out of all of them because we've already solved the climate crisis in the past and people don't know about it because we did it so well. I think this is something that I, I always try to tell people when they, you know, are looking for some hope. So this crisis, there was like um, at a certain point, scientists around 1985, they started to notice, hey, there's a very big hole above the Antarctics <laughs> in the ozone and it's only getting bigger. And this is going to have catastrophic consequences for the earth. and yeah. Um, then they tried to see, you know, kind of see where the 
what, what was causing it. And they found that mm -hmm. it, this was a chemical compound called a yeah, CFC. And this comes from hairspray and from refrigerators and like from mm -hmm. quite a lot of, um, you know, products that were being used at the time and yeah. were, the, were the cause of this massive hole. And because of that, um, in the end, there was a giant, uh, they, they released this information into the public. People started yeah. to get angry. They wanted change. And uh, the governments responded. So actually it was like a, a very big, like almost like a Paris Agreement, um, you know, event going on where all countries came together and they mm -hmm. came to the Montreal Protocol, actually, which mm -hmm. said, okay, the CFCs, they need to disappear. Like they need to be gone within yeah. five to 10 years. Because of this protocol, companies had to change the products that they were making. So this, this CFC compound uh, or chemical, it needed to be out of the production. And mm -hmm. we, over like the 1990s into the early 2000s, um, this was slowly brought out of all production. And now it's not because it's a, it's a, it's an illegal <laughs> a chemical basically. So you're not allowed to use yeah. it anymore. And the, the hole is, well, it's not completely fixed yet because it takes time. Um, but it is significantly reduced. So, and, and so wow. it's not at those levels anymore that it can cause giant catastrophic right. uh, events. So we did it already. So, oh, let's just nice. do it again, right? <laughs> well, just, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we can do it again. And I think that that's the, the best argument you can give any person, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. There are a lot of people um, together. We can do a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of people are concerned with the fact that uh, it seems likely that we're going to pass uh, the global warming limits. But like in this story with the, um, or in this example of the, the ozone, uh, it takes time, but at least we can reduce uh, the amount of damage that will be done. So maybe you Definitely. could uh, still elaborate a little bit on that, Zasla. Uh, we, we slowly come to a realization, right, that we are most likely going to pass the, the 1.5 to 2 degrees global warming limit. But that doesn't mean, you know, like the previous arguments, that we should just accept it. And... Mm -hmm. um, Yes, it takes time to, you know, if, if we start to, if we would all stop doing everything that's bad for the environment right now, it would still take a very long time for the environment. Well, if you look at the, 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 the lifespan of the earth, it's of course just a millisecond, but for us, it would still take quite some time for everything to be, you know, come back to normal if that's ever possible. Yeah. Um, but we can at least try to shorten that effect, right? And make sure that mm -hmm. this if we pass these limits, that we only pass them a little bit and that we pass them in such a way that we can still handle the consequences. So it will definitely impact the planet and it impact ev everyone, mm -hmm. but we can try to limit it and be able to still keep the consequences manageable. And I think that's why, um, that, that I think that's exactly what happened in the past. They noticed it. They were already at a very severe point, right? The, this hole was, right. was massive. But they were able to slowly over the years, yeah, tackle the, the, the problem. And I think we should yeah. do the same right now. No. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think, yeah, hopefully this brings hopefulness to people I who so um, <laughs> are maybe dealing with these types of counter arguments, either from colleagues or friends or family or just, uh, I don't know, on the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. yeah. Um, yeah, it was really, really nice to have this conversation. I think it's important to to keep having these conversations, um, yeah, with the people that you encounter in your in your daily life. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Give everybody hope. Yes, thank you as well, yes. honey. Thanks for listening to our chat. Don't forget to follow and review so we know how you like the conversation. See you next time. <laughs>